Hey guys, I'm Sarah Levon and welcome back to my YouTube channel. February is almost over and so I am back to answer your questions from YouTube comments and then from Instagram. So if you don't subscribe, make sure you do and then head on over to Instagram and be sure to follow me over there so that you can stay up to date on all the things, pregnancy, birth, and postpartum. Some of the things that we are gonna be talking about today are retained placentas and how that affects your birth and afterbirth. We talk about flat nipples and how that affects breastfeeding. We talk signs that labor might be near and coming, all your anesthesia options for a C-section. We talk about induction of labor. We talk about leg cramps and what you can do about them. And then when you can start doing all of those engaging the baby exercises, you guys are asking me that all the time. If you have any questions about what we're talking about today, everything's gonna be in the description box down below. Thank you so much for being here, and then let's get started. We are gonna go over to YouTube and get started over there. I have a question from Megan Posey. This was on my coffee and questions from January, 2020, and she says, since the only way to know the position of the baby is by ultrasound, and they don't typically do any more ultrasounds after the 20 week scan, how do they know for sure if the baby is head down versus breech at the time of delivery? When a foot comes out? <laughs> I hope that it's not when a foot comes out, okay? It would be more common to do an ultrasound between 35 and 37 weeks strictly to look at the position of the baby. Now, there are other ways to know the position of the baby, but by no, I mean like loosely no, because you're not actually gonna know. The gold standard is ultrasound, but you can feel the belly and feel for where the baby is and kind of determine whether it's a booty up here or whether it's a head up here um, by like, feel also like where your kicks are and stuff. But again, you're right. The only way to really know is by ultrasound. So they will likely do an ultrasound 35, 37 weeks, and they will do an ultrasound to look at the head downness of the baby. Now, if they do a vaginal exam and you're super dilated, we can tell that way too. A butt feels very different than a head. So there's other ways to know. Ultrasound being gold standard, they will likely look towards the end of your pregnancy strictly for that reason. Lexus TV, this comes from my breastfeeding how to know that the baby is getting enough milk video. She says, I have a flat nipple. Should I be concerned about properly latching or breastfeeding my baby? Okay, so there are different types of nipples out there, lots of different types of nipples. And typically like you do want something for the baby to latch onto, but one of my examples of that is, I'm wearing lipstick so I won't do it now, but like if you go to suck on your hand, I can suck on my hand, right? I don't need a nipple on my hand in order to suck on it. <laughs> so your baby can latch with flat nipples or even inverted nipples. Now, what I will say is that you would anticipate a little bit that you might need some extra support. Um, I would also anticipate that probably in the hospital setting, a nipple shield will come out and be offered to you by the nurses. A nipple shield is a great tool. It's like this little silicone thing with a little nipple shaped Audi thing that goes like sticks onto your boob and then it like helps suck, like suck the nipple into the nipple shield thing and pulls it out so that your baby can latch a little easier. So if you're having issues, it is a tool. I just would recommend that you try to breastfeed without, that you just have to sandwich the breast and you're like smushing the skin. I need more skin, like where's my fat? Like here, like if this was a boob, <laughs> you'd like sandwich the skin and then now all of a sudden baby can latch on like that a lot easier than would be if you don't sandwich it, like they're just trying to grab. So you would gr grab the breast and give them something to grab onto. So I would say, don't stress about it. Just say, okay, noted. It would be something to bring up to your care team. Say, can you really help me? I really wanna latch without a nipple shield. I'm concerned about it. There are other ways around it. You can always call a lactation consultant and ask to see somebody while you're in the hospital and they can help you troubleshoot your flat nipples or your inverted nipples if you were to have inverted nipples. Not a big deal, no stress about it. Just anticipate maybe doing a tiny bit more work. So this comes from Joyce Kim on my induction of labor at 39 weeks video. She says, what are your thoughts on induction for people with gestational diabetes? So I like this question, especially because it does link back to my two videos. They're more recent on gestational diabetes. So if you haven't seen those, go over there and watch that. 
It is super common. If you have gestational diabetes, it is super common for you to potentially be looking at an induction of labor, probably around 39 weeks. So this is where I actually like the link between the 39 week induction of labor video, because I think a lot of times people get induction in their head and they're like, ah, I'm gonna have a C-section. It's like, there are so many risks and blah, blah, blah. It's not necessarily like that. And there is some good evidence that an induction at 39 weeks is a reasonable option for you. Um, so I think that my perspective, meaning like my medical self, um, would not be giving you advice, but would recommend that you listen to your doctor or your midwife based on what's happening with your pregnancy. And there is a difference between a medical induction of labor and then an elective induction of labor. And the 39 week induction video that I have is specifically for an elective induction, meaning there's nothing going on in your pregnancy. But if you have gestational diabetes, that would actually be considered a medical induction. And in that case, is recommended that you continue with an induction. Now you can do whatever you want, but that would be not the like, I really have a choice. You always have a choice, but it's like, within your as much control. It's like there's actually a medical reason why it's safer to get the baby out now, but you don't have to have a C-section right now. Like there's still time. So I would say if your doctor's recommending it, then watch my induction of labor videos, take my childbirth class, specifically my medical interventions class, watch those gestational diabetes videos, and then you're gonna be set. And you can still have a beautiful birth memory and pursue all of your birth dreams. This comes from Can You Induce Labor Naturally Part One. Annabelle Miller says, is it true that evening primrose oil and pineapple soften your cervix? So I actually talk about evening primrose oil in a previous coffee and question, so you can go over there, but pineapple does not have any evidence behind it. People talk about pineapple. I love pineapple. Like go eat yourself some pineapple as long as you don't have gestational diabetes. But in general, the answer is no, it doesn't have any evidence behind it, but if you wanna try and do all the things and eat yourself some pineapple, go for it. Ooh, this is such a good one. Okay, Tanya Kawa Rossier says, on my breastfeeding, how do I know if my baby's getting enough milk video? She says, do you have any tips for painful nighttime leg cramping? I drink a lot of water throughout the day, and even though at night when I get up to pee, I know dehydration isn't a factor. Any other helpful tips, tricks, or info with like a crying emoji? Okay, so we're not crying anymore. Leg cramps are super annoying and also very common in pregnancy. And so you probably need more magnesium in your diet. So magnesium-rich foods, I will link some down below. I could do an Instagram post on this. In fact, I think I already did do an Instagram post, so go over to Instagram and follow me over there. But magnesium, one of my, you can take a magnesium supplement. I have one on my pregnancy Amazon list that I really love. It was recommended to me by an acupuncturist here in LA, who's amazing by the way. Um, so you can take a magnesium supplement that will help because magnesium is a muscle relaxant. So if you're cramping and you know dehydration isn't an issue, that's step one. It is true that like, if you're dehydrated, you're gonna cramp more, including your uterus. So make sure your water's good, that you're drinking to thirst and your pee is almost clear. And then add a magnesium supplement or magnesium rich foods, or you can do a magnesium bath, which I personally love, me and my baths. Um, and so Epsom salts, they have magnesium. A lot of them have magnesium in them. And so you can do a mineral bath. Your body will absorb some of that and that can help to relax your muscles. No more leg cramps, no more crying. Take some magnesium and let me know how it goes. This also comes from my breastfeeding video, even though it doesn't really have anything to do with breastfeeding. Um, Brianna J says, I was hoping you could make a video about spinals for a C-section. So this would link back to my C-section video, prepping for a C-section, what to expect. I don't know what it's called, but I can link it down below. And she tells her whole story about her C-section and how she didn't like it. There were some things that went on. Um, she says, I'm so nervous. History might repeat itself. What are the odds? So I will talk about spinal really quickly because there are different types of anesthesia that can be used for a C-section. For a C-section, you can have an epidural anesthesia, spinal anesthesia, or general anesthesia. Those are pretty much, I suppose they could do local, but like that would only be in very unique scenarios and you wouldn't want that. You want like to be totally numb. The epidural and the spinal are super common and super, um, standardized, like they're they're like kind of the same thing. It's just what medication goes into the space and what space in your back. If you have a scheduled C-section, you are probably looking at a spinal anesthesia. 
So with a spinal, they would numb your back. It's kind of the same process as an epidural, which I talk about in my childbirth class or my medical interventions class. And so you'd lean over, they'd numb the area, and then they would find the spinal space and then just inject a little bit of medication. And then it makes you numb, like completely numb, paralyzed numb, like not forever paralyzed, but like where you literally can't move a toe, numb from below your breasts down. One of the things that kind of makes people stressed out a lot of times with the spinal is the fact that it can touch the nerves in your diaphragm. And so it doesn't make it so you can't breathe, but because you have decreased sensation in your diaphragm, it sometimes feels like you're like, I can't breathe. And so I remind you right now, if you ever end up in that scenario, hear my voice and take a deep breath and feel your lungs fill, you're breathing, okay? So, but it does kind of, that can be stressful for people with the spinal. It works super fast and it works for about four to six hours. Typically by the time you get through your C-section into the recovery room, you're able to wiggle your toes again. You may be able to bend your knees. You might even be able to lift your butt, although very much more uncommon with a spinal. So it's in and out, inject the medication, we're done. Whereas with an epidural, they would actually place the little catheter or little tube in the epidural space versus the spinal space, hence the name. And then that gets usually connected to a pump where you're getting continuous medication throughout. But for a C-section, they would just use that tube to inject a higher concentration of medication than they would use for labor to numb you from below your breast down. Sometimes you have a tiny bit more movement. It takes a tiny bit longer to like take take function <laughs> to work in your body versus the spinal. Like when you're sitting up, I'm like, okay, lay down. Cause then all of a sudden your legs go dead. And I'm like, and now hold on. And I'm like lifting your dead weight legs onto the table. So we want to lay you down. Where's the epidural? You have a tiny bit more leeway for that. And then if they needed to, they could give you more medication to keep you numb. Now the spinal works very well. That is the recommendation. And then it wears off rather than leaving something in your back. We call that a vector. So medically that's a, a place that could potentially introduce bacteria into the epidural space, which is no good. And so if we, if you have the choice, especially for a scheduled case, you're probably gonna get a spinal. Now, general, on the other hand, would be when we have to put you to sleep. They do intubate, so they put you on like a breathing tube and you're out, you don't remember it. And the hard part about that is, first of all, that you don't remember the birth of your child, like you're asleep for it. A lot of times they don't let the partner in. And then the other risk with general anesthesia is it does go into your IV, which shares with the baby, not your IV doesn't share with the baby, but your bloodstream is shared with the baby. So the baby gets some of the medication. And so there's a risk to the baby to come out with having some issues breathing, which is important, right? We love babies breathing. And so general anesthesia is going to be reserved for your emergency scenarios where there just generally is not time to place an epidural or a spinal or if the epidural spinal wasn't working, or if there was some sort of contraindication, like a bleeding, you had a bleeding disorder or something, then they may say, sorry, not an issue, not a thing. We have to do general anesthesia. Okay. First line of treatment, scheduled case, spinal anesthesia, epidural, then general. I'm probably just going to keep saying this in all of my coffee and questions because this keeps coming up over and over and over again. This comes from my how to engage the baby for a faster labor. Um, first of all, I say at one point, I say 30 seconds and then I also say 30 minutes when I'm talking about like getting on your head with your butt in the air. It's 30 minutes, okay? Not 30 seconds. You can do it for 30 seconds, but it's not going to have the same benefit. The other thing that everybody is asking, including Andrea Carella, she says, when should you start doing all of this? She's 33 weeks. You can start doing it really at any point, second trimester. Earlier on, it's not gonna do as much slash it doesn't really matter. But the closer that you get to your due date, um, the more that you should be doing this. 37 weeks, get going, okay? If you're 33 weeks, go for it. I would say 28 would be like the earliest. Prior to that, you can do it. I don't know how much benefit it will have for you. Um, but there really isn't too early. It's just that like in general, it would be more to soften things up rather than to get the baby in the right position. So Miss Crystal 09 says, is it normal to feel pressure when you sit down in your coochie area sometimes? <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yes, it's normal, especially the closer you get to delivery as the baby drops and gets lower and lower in your pelvis. Of course, like you're gonna feel some pressure. Even if the baby's not in your vagina, like it's pressing down on all of your structures and it, it can be uncomfortable. So that's where like a birth ball comes in handy, sitting on a pillow, laying on your side, those little like butt cushions that like leave a hole in it, that can also help. Um, but absolutely, that is normal. Fearless Ruby says, when you're done with your breast pump, what do you do with it? She'd like to donate it, which is so sweet of you. 
Um, so if you have a Medela pump, which a lot of, that's like one of the more popular breast pump companies, PS, you get a free breast pump typically in the United States with your insurance. So don't go out and buy a breast pump, call your insurance and ask for one. My recommendation is the Spectra. Medela is great too. If you have a Medela, you, they have a return thing, like where you can turn it in and recycle it. But actually the FDA for all your organizations, even like like your charitable organizations, that it's actually not acceptable to reuse a pump. So you could gift it to a friend and pass it around that way. But unfortunately, there's like an FDA regulation against sharing breast pumps between people. You are the sweetest person in the world, but unfortunately, donating breast pumps, there's nowhere that I'm aware of, and including the FDA thing, it's probably not a thing. Marley Peron official says, what does the onset of labor pains feel like? Pressure, tummy ache, Braxton Hicks, all, some, none. Great question. So this would go back to my when not to go to the hospital video and then my when to go to the hospital video. I also talk about this extensively in my labor prep class. So if you really wanna get a good idea about that, then that's where you need to go for that. But the onset of labor is gonna be different for different people, but in general, anticipate there to be tightening in your belly. If you've been having Braxton Hicks, which is just those like false contractions, your belly getting hard, then you might feel some of those and then they may progress to be more frequent where you're like, it doesn't really hurt, but like there's some action happening in my belly or in my uterus. And then all of a sudden it starts to feel like menstrual cramps or some dull lower back pain. The key is that it comes and it goes. And so if it's constant, like there's probably something else, it's maybe a structural thing, maybe a positional thing with the baby, but all of a sudden you're noticing like, wait a second, there's more going on in my uterus than there used to be. And I would say, ignore it till you can't ignore it anymore, but it may feel like a tummy ache. I've had people describe it like they thought they had indigestion. I've had people that like somebody that, actually she didn't know she was pregnant, but like thought she was having her appendix bursting or something. And so like any kind of, any kind of action in your belly where your belly feels firmer may mean that the onset of labor is near, your body's working towards it until it becomes an established rhythm where contractions are regular in strength and frequency and really stopping you in your tracks, that we're gonna let that kind of happen how it happens for however long it takes. Um, but typically menstrual cramps, tightening, lower back pain are probably the most common things that I hear. This is also really, really common. This is from Klessard. Um, She says, signs that labor might be near. Okay, so this kind of tags onto the last one. And this comes from the number of DMs I get from you guys where you're like freaking out. I have talked about this so many times. I guess I'm gonna have to keep talking about it to remind you that you could have no signs nothing, no pressure, no Braxton Hicks, no, uh, I don't know, baby dropping, all of a sudden being able to breathe, flu-like symptoms, all the things I talk about my when not to go to the hospital video, and you could go into labor right now, okay? So please, guys, we gotta let go of this because it's so constant, and I know you wanna have your babies like right now, and I know you're desperate to not be pregnant anymore, but for you to stress, about what's not happening or, oh, there's like, oh, it's never gonna be here because I have none of the signs that everybody talks about on all the blogs and Google that you're reading, it means nothing for you. Your water could break two seconds later and then all of a sudden you're having contractions and you have your baby six hours later. Like that's how quick things can change. The baby dropping is another huge source of stress that I hear from you guys and this baby is going to drop at some point and whether it happens in labor or during labor, in labor, <laughs> before labor or during labor or when your baby's coming out like it's gonna come down and out and so you want to do the things that you can control and if it makes you feel better get on your ball and do all the things I talk about in my engaging the baby video and then know what the signs that you're looking for are but then let it go please guys let it go I know you're looking for those signs but the more stress you have the more you're trying to hold on and the more tension you hold in your body the more it just pushes labor away and so best thing you can do I also have a video on this one that like once you've done all the things, you gotta just let go. Let it go, it's not a big deal. You're gonna get there. You will not be pregnant forever. Chelsea Ann Black says, how often do they have to scrape the placental remnants right after birth? So scraping, what that means would be what we call a manual removal of the placenta. So typically once the baby's out, 
then you're chilling skin to skin, you let your cord pulse a little bit, they clamp cut, and then the placenta is like, oh, I'm done. I don't need to be used anymore. I have done my job and I'm going to detach from the side of the uterus and then I'm gonna come out. And so it just kind of like detaches and then they kind of support it coming out and then that's it. But occasionally, the placenta, what we call a retained placenta, where the placenta either has a hard time coming out or it comes out, but there's still little fragments left inside, like little chunks of it that kind of came off and got stuck on the side of the uterus. And so I would say that that's not super common, but it does happen. And in that case, what would happen is that the provider would reach up your vagina and manually remove it from the side of the wall of the uterus, which is not fun, especially if you don't have an epidural. I have seen it plenty of times where they're like, I'm so sorry, but we gotta get the placenta out because if there's any retained placental fragments, it's going to be a risk factor for you bleeding too much, which we very much don't want. We want you to keep all that blood inside. You can bleed a little bit, but not too much. And it potentially has impact on your breastfeeding and fertility in the future. And so you don't want them left in there. Sometimes you don't even know until later when you're like, I'm trying to get pregnant, what's going on? They do an ultrasound, oops, there's some placenta left inside. You know, or I'm having major milk issues and I just, the breastfeeding has been such a struggle, oops, there's some placenta left inside. And so you do want it all out. Sometimes they do have to reach inside and grab it. Um, and then hopefully it all comes out. Now, there's also something called a placenta accreta, percreta, increta. If you want a video on this, it would be like a complications of pregnancy situation where the placenta not only detaches, which is supposed to just kind of like stick, where it's like, ooh, I'm here, and then it comes off. Whereas if it sticks, but then it goes a little deeper and actually embeds into the uterus, then it doesn't come. And we're like, what's going on? This placenta is not coming, she's bleeding, and it may require surgical intervention, okay? So it doesn't sound like that was the case in this scenario, but my nurse brain is going all over the place with this, and so sometimes they have to do it. It can be uncomfortable if you have an epidural, you'd be like, oh, cool, wow, their whole hand is up my vagina and scraping it off, and then you're done, okay? And hopefully it doesn't lead to too much bleeding. Thanks everyone for being with me here today. I know that a lot of you guys, like you're constantly having questions and I'm getting DMs all the time and all of that. And so something that I wanna make sure that you're aware of is that on my website, I have something called a one-on-one -on -one with me. It's very self-explanatory, where if you're like, I wanna process my birth or I have this super specific scenario or I have this whole list of questions that are not getting answered on a platform like this, I do do one-on-one -on -one calls. If you want help putting together your birth preferences, if you wanna follow up from one of my classes that you took and you're like, wait a second, I have XYZ amount of questions left, I have that one-on-one -on, -one on my website. I also have an app that's, if you just go to the app store, it's Bundle Birth and then it's a way to call me and it's literally, they charge by minute. So if you're like, I don't need an hour, but I need 10 minutes, then it makes it a little bit more affordable to you. So you can go on to the app store. I will link everything down below and you can connect with me one-on-one -on -one and actually talk to me. I'd love to talk you through and make sure that you're feeling comfortable and we can kind of wrap everything up and make it feel really, really good for you going into your birth experience. If you need help strategizing with a provider, literally anything you wanna need, I am here for you. It's another way to connect, another way to stay in the loop together. Another way to do that is by taking a childbirth class, which I've mentioned throughout this. I have a coping with labor class online. And then over on Instagram. I am on stories a lot on Instagram. I'm giving you other little nuggets of wisdom and tools for pregnancy, birth, postpartum. So head on over there. Make sure you subscribe down below. And then until next time, don't forget to flex and flow. And I will see you soon. Bye. Hey guys, I'm Sarah Levon and welcome back to my YouTube channel. I had to swallow. <laughs> Is that cheesy? Well, sorry, really matter, but the closer you get to your due date, <clears throat> whoa, <clears throat> what happened? Ooh. I don't know. I don't know. You a I, I really do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't even know how to act like a smoker. Today, some of the things that we are talking about are about, are about what is that? Like, sound like a seal. <laughs> more uncommon than common to not do and more common. <laughs> what did I say?